Hey everybody, this is J.D. Olson with the Martial Art Limited Association and Carlos Machado Jiu-Jitsu. I am here with the man himself, Professor Carlos Machado, and so today we're going to go ahead and ask him a few questions. Uh, another interview video for, coming for you guys out there. So what I want to start with is a little bit about history. So why did your family pick BJJ? Uh, it's a mixture of fate and convenience. Uh, my mom, uh, you know, was sister to late Carlos Gracie Sr.'s wife, okay. my aunt Lair. And since we we're kids, we were introduced to the martial arts because uh, she was already very keen that her kids would get involved with that at a point in time. Uh, you know, so our Gracie cousins were instrumental. In, Correct. You know, so it was just kind of like we were born into it, so to speak. <laughs> uh, what was it like growing up in like the golden era of jiu-jitsu? Because I, I know like you're, I've seen pictures of you like in the back of the truck with the Gracie family and of course mm -hmm. all that. What was that like growing up with all those guys? First of all, great childhood, very close-knit family. Uh, amazing the fact that we had uh, an activity like jiu-jitsu that not only gave us the opportunity to, you know, when you're kids and you do sports, uh, it's hard to stay focused mm -hmm. for long in a certain one. You see kids switching around. And uh, I think with us having our cousins as our instructors, uh, so we had family and the activity all tied up together. That's cool. So, uh, you know, go, growing up with them, you know, it was uh, a lot of examples, a lot of history, uh, especially from the patriarchs, uh, late Carlos and Helio Gracie, and a lot of the elder um, jiu-jitsu, you know, Gracie family members. And then my brother seen it, the upbringing, us all growing together. It was, uh, it was not, it was kind of like uh, living in a dorm. Okay. From childhood to <laughs> adulthood. Gotcha. You know, uh, because there are tons of them. And we had five of us, uh, so right. you know, it was a, a big old bunch. That was actually so. going to lead me to my next question is, so what, is it, what was it like growing up with four other brothers that do jiu-jitsu? Because like, I'm an only child, so I mm -hmm. have no frame of reference, yeah. but like, I'm assuming you guys had to like, clear out the living room every day to... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> well, uh, we always had mats. Okay. Wherever we were, besides the academies we trained at, we always had rooms in every house that we lived that had uh, mat space available. Wow. But, if that was not the case, move the coffee table out of the way <laughs> and practice on the carpet, which kind of like uh, my brothers, if I could say something, was uh, Higan and I became black belts first, okay. Okay? but uh, in the upbringing of my younger uh, Machado brothers, besides being students and disciples, they became training partners and eventually coaches and mentors to us. So I owe to my brothers, as a matter of fact, uh, a great part of my trajectory in terms right. of my techniques and my jiu-jitsu blueprint. That's awesome. Um, switching over a little bit, so talking about training. So again, I mentioned like you came up in the golden era of BJJ, so you got to be at the academy and you were training, of course, with you know the Gracie family as well as, of course, your brothers. And so what was the environment like at the academy for that kind of stuff? You know, it's kind of like... Um, when you go and do a job, you know, uh, that you like, mm -hmm. so you don't feel it's a job. You know, being at the academy for us was everything. There was a social component, there was a training, uh, but the, also there was the degree of effort uh, and uh, how they put the grit, you know, because if, when you have training partners, training partners who don't slack, they're at your level or above your level, you, you're not going to have an easy day right. at office. But when you have challenges in terms of your growth, especially knowing that you can count on that group to push you forward, you know, uh, it became kind of like the three muske musketeers kind of approach, one for all and all for one. Yeah. So no matter who was the one on top at a point in time, the attitude was always to help everybody else reach their potential. So I felt it was a blessing, you know. But... At the same time, it was uh, it kept us honest because yeah. we knew that if any of us slacked in our training, all the other relatives they, they would still stay on course, <laughs> and you'd have your day of reckoning anytime you came back. Gotcha. You know? uh, I finished the book *Breathe* by Hicks and Gracie, and he talks about like how I guess they would go to one of their houses and they would kind of have like um, all the family members kind of have to fight each other to see who the top dog was. Was that the same for for the Machado family? No, we had a pecking order established uh, 
without having to actually go anywhere. It was mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis, gotcha. you know, and uh, we knew how each other were. You know, we know that it would never be easy going against each other because we all trained hard enough and became, in my opinion, accomplished enough technically that any given time it would be a challenge. But uh, we, we, we didn't, we, we didn't uh, try to figure out who was, at a particular time, the one on top, the top gun of the school. We just knew already mm -hmm. on our day-to-day, -day, so to speak. What, um, what is your best or favorite memory from training back then? Or training in general, I guess. I think, I think uh, it's not so much just when it happened, is the circumstances surrounding it. At that time, we didn't know we were to be part of history at a point in time. So you're just going with the flow without feeling the burden or the sense of mission. You're just there. I'm going to go train. I'm going to just think about my training. I'm not, I don't have any further concern mm. about the world at large, which changes as you become an instructor and then you kind of phase into mentorship, like yes, what we do now. You, you, become, you feel like you're accountable uh, and responsible for people's uh, progress and the way you affect them. Gotcha. So... What, was, uh, what do you think was one of your biggest obstacles or hurdles to overcome in your training? I think it was more of a psychological than anything else. Um, you know, nowadays, for instance, uh, you, you have the psychology of sports, mm -hmm. you know, sports psychology. At that time, we had to learn, you know, uh, deal with our egos or seeking approval of others. For me, the main thing was I, wanna, I was doing things at a certain point in time to please my instructors. And I felt I was a bit uh, losing track what was fulfilling me individually. Makes sense. And I think uh, that transition took place uh, once I came to America. I became more, let's say, self-reliant hmm. in some ways. Um, advice for training uh, to minimize injuries, especially like as, as we're aging and stuff like that. I know mm -hmm. we talked about this last night at dinner. What advice would you have for anybody who might be watching about you know continuing your training and not getting hurt okay so um there are three pillars okay, okay. Uh, i think the 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 motto that we have is uh train smart stay humble right okay so those two approaches which originates from leaving your ego at the door you know it kind of gives you perspective you're not there for a death match every time you go to the school <laughs> the tapping aspect of jiu-jitsu doesn't hurt your pride because you know it's part of the steps in terms of growth. You know, right. you need to learn where you're weak, where you're not, you have to be exposed enough so you can get your learning curve upgraded. And, and the other thing too is on the three pillars, you know, you have the activity, you have the supporting uh, activities, and you have the lifestyle. The lifestyle kind of incorporates everything. For instance, uh, everything starts sound nutrition. You okay. know, uh, we had the Gracie diet at that time nowadays you know, we try always to look at what health options we have in terms of how we eat. I adopted the carnivore diet Correct. with success uh, a while back. Uh, the nutritional supplementation with what we have now with uh, the Machado Method supplements, for instance. You know, if you don't take supplementation, especially collagen, you know, and joint supplements and all the different multivitamins and minerals, they are lacking in the average diet. You know, it, it sets you back in the hacks. You know, the mm -hmm. red light therapy, the cryotherapy, chiropractic care, you know, stretching. And, and some people do yoga, some others. They, you find all oh, sauna, red sauna. So there are so many different things. Uh, but the, the main point here that I say is you got to focus as much if you're diligent about your training. Not just training smart in regards, for instance, some days are more for skill building, which shouldn't be as hard. It's more tactical. You're trying to further your threshold how close you can get to complete a sequence or a particular technique you want to be good at. So you have a training partner that, that gradually sabotages you but doesn't sabotage you all the way. And then you have the Hondori days where you just go all out and train and you try to see if you can make the techniques work. So before I thought train hard every day, roll really hard every day, you know, and, you know, and then do drills on top of it. We always believed in doing drills mm -hmm. with resistance, in my opinion. It makes you learn faster in your muscle memory. But uh, we missed out on the recovery part, you know? And the problem is when you're younger, 
uh, especially nowadays, unfortunately, people take enhancing substances to disguise the effects or the wear and tear so they can kind of pro pro prolong a little bit right. the, uh, the recovery uh, with the, those, uh, you know, cheating, you know, but on a natural uh, way, I feel you have to spend as much time recovering as you do practicing. Wow, okay. And, 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 and just to complement, your goal is to get better. Right. You know, not just get tougher. The get tougher will happen as you get better. Okay, so some days you're going to go harder, but you should alternate going easier pace just for skill building approach. Gotcha. And what about like the same kind of question? So what advice would you have for either a smaller person doing jujitsu or getting started or a woman who's trying to get into the sport but has to fight bigger, heavier opponents all the time and necessarily that person isn't always, you know, willing to just be like, a good training partner sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, when it comes to uh, safety and comfort, uh, you work, how do you deal with pressure in jiu-jitsu? And I think it doesn't matter gender, men or women, it's more related to size and strength. So you're gonna see that the disparity of sizes, if you have a skinnier and lighter opponent or training partner, uh, the lighter one uh, I mean, everybody across the board, but the latter one in particular, their main concern is the survival aspect of jiu-jitsu first. Okay. So what would you focus on? And I think white belts in general should follow that same mindset. Uh, learn how to deal with pressure and be comfortable in uncomfortable situations and build up from there. And that, that way you're going to be able to uh, uh, minimize the size differences that happen throughout your training when you go against a bigger one. A gotcha. bigger training partner. And then the last question for the training section, uh, you of course have four other brothers. What would you say is one thing you've taken from each one of them that complements what you do now? It's kind of like you, you watch a, a, a movie like uh, The Axeman, all right? And then you look at each brother, they have certain unique gifts or powers mm -hmm. that pertain to their style, to their game, to their body type, to their nature. And uh, it's almost like uh, I tried to absorb what is the main strength of each brother? And if I could steal all their powers and apply onto me to the degree of my capacity, you know, uh, like Jean-Jacques has incredible arm attacks. He's very fast, always known for great arm bars. Although nowadays he does a lot of back attacks. You know, uh, my brother Higa was the, all about the pressure. And his guard has always been incredible, you know, submissions okay. and reversals. And the other two brothers have a, a hybrid of those two, cool. you know. Uh, so I, I really tried to pick, okay, I don't want to be him. I want to be as close to him as I can on his ace move. Gotcha. Okay, moving into part three, uh, coming to America, and you have shared this with the Machado group privately, but I did want to get it because I think it's one of my favorite things you've ever talked to us about. Um, I wanted to get the RCJ story. I know you mentioned like you were... Uh, you and your brothers were like living in a small house. I guess you were all sharing a space mm -hmm. and then Chuck Norris gave you a spot to use. So I wanted you to kind of tell our people sure. that because I love that story. So I met Chuck in 88, going to a seminar in Las Vegas. I was part of the group with my cousins that was invited to teach jujitsu to their karate organization for the first time. My brother Higgin came to the US the year after, <coughs> excuse me, in 89. And, uh, after a year here, teaching at the garage you know, with the prospect of working with my cousin Horian, uh, he invited us over, said, man, you guys got to come and give it a try. This is a great place to be. Jiu-Jitsu is still not established over here. Great opportunity. So my brother John and I came along after Higgin. John Jacques and Roger followed suit shortly gotcha. after. But <clears throat> we used to teach a, at the garage dojo, a double car garage. Mm -hmm. That was our first kind of like doing privates and group sessions here and there. And uh, eventually, uh, Chuck Norris came to our house to a common friend of ours, Richard Norton, and wanted to do a, a training session with us in our garage. And from there, he invited us to go train him. He became a private client okay. at his own uh, house. He had met areas there as well in days that he used to work out. And from there, he suggested, you know, I have a mall here with my friend Bob Wall, he's my partner in the mall. I'll hook you guys up uh, and build up a, a little gym for you guys, a little school for you just to get established. So we had a 
nice little academy uh, in Tarzana, one of the malls that uh, Chuck Norris co-owned. Okay. And from there, you know, we, we you know, started to uh, jump into the journey of establishing our brand in the United States. Uh, RCJ brought the initials of all the brothers, Roger mm -hmm. and Regan, Carlos, John, and Jean-Jacques, or Jean. Uh, and uh, that was the name of our first school after we decided that we would use our name and not our cousins' names. We didn't want to step on any toes gotcha. in regards to, you know, creating the impression we were trying to take advantage of their effort because they came ahead of us mm -hmm. to establish here. Uh, and with that said, there was also a philosophical aspect to it. We had some different uh, way of thinking in certain ways. So getting the Machado name then, shortly after we got the Tarzana school, we also got another school in Redondo Beach. Mm -hmm. So we got two schools, and eventually I came to Texas, established another RCJ Academy uh, in Dallas. Gotcha. But as, as any kitchen, when you have too many chefs <laughs> in the kitchen, it's really hard because all the brothers, they're involved in so many different projects, and each of us on our own have big, good followings. Uh, we felt it was in the best interest for us to individually run our organizations and have a cooperation like we did the Brothers Camp in the mm -hmm. past and things like that so we can conciliate uh, efforts to make the most of what we could, you know. Gotcha. Uh, what was it like working with Chuck Norris and being a Walker, Texas Ranger? So Chuck Norris uh, was a very gifted student. Uh, he had a photographic memory. was one of the few students I had that I shot, I showed him something once. He would do it right away. Wow. Yeah, amazing, amazing. One of the fastest learners I've ever seen in my life. Uh, with that said, very genuine. He helped out so many people. And my first academy actually was within his TV studio in Las Colinas, uh, okay. one of the suburbs of Dallas. They used to have a red light buzzer uh, that uh, would always turn it on whenever they had uh, Show you know, shows rolling on the set. And we had to kind of keep quiet, and I would do the instruction, you know, with low voice and everything. But uh, amazing crew. I met many of the co-stars and different actors throughout the time. Got beat up by Chuck Norris more than any of the Machados or anybody <laughs> that I can think of in the martial arts. So that's my claim to fame. <laughs> I was the most beat up the jiu-jitsu guy that, you know, that Chuck Norris ever beat, you know. So cool. amazing. Now you mentioned, uh, you know, how you guys kind of broke off. You're going your own way. Now it's um, instead of RCJ Machado, it's now, you know, Carlos Machado Jiu-Jitsu. I know John Jock has one. Mm -hmm. Egan has one. So uh, that was kind of my next thing is like, what is, uh, what is it your plan for your legacy? Okay, like, so, what do you want to have happen on So uh, what happened is, let's say I'm teaching a class here today, right? So what's my goal? It's not to teach a class. It's to cause an experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... If the student walks into the, the mat and after I teach, I want that person to feel different than where, how they felt before the class. Gotcha. So if somebody comes to my organization, uh, the goal that I have goes a bit beyond just that person. I want to make sure I affect the generations to come. That's where the legacy mindset is in consideration. For instance, uh, I don't want that guy just to be a better martial artist. I want that the benefits of martial arts to trickle down to him becoming a better individual, uh, a better businessman, um, you know, everything in a way that it narrows into uh, a lifestyle where martial arts is impactful in all areas, not just skills, but the way you live your life. What's on the mat, should, what happens on the mat should be carried on off the mat. Okay. So in order for, in, just to make it a little shorter, when me and Adam, my partner Adam Carl, uh, established uh, these agreements to build the association to, with that vision, see, our goal is the future. We are doing everything in the present to prepare. Right. Well, by before, I didn't have the same, I always had a sense of mission, but it becomes more clear. Mm -hmm as time goes by and the amount of people that are coming to us and the effects of what we're doing in their lives. Does it ever uh, blow your mind that hundreds if not thousands of people have been influenced by, by you specifically in Jiu Jitsu? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because um, when you make history, it's kind of hard to detach and see yourself 
from a spectator's perspective. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's like you're an actor, you're doing the scene, but the director, <laughs> whoever is the person watching behind the camera is the one that sees the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So we really feel, uh, I, I still see it's in the making, but uh, it's kind of like, because I, I still feel my mission is so far ahead in regards to what I want to accomplish, you know, still yet to come, a lot of things, uh, I can't detach myself. But I, I feel humbled, though, when I go in the middle of a de desert in Australia and I see guys wearing the Carlos Machado patch right. and doing jiu-jitsu in, in the down under, you know, so uh, yeah, cause even it's we're a humbling. At the, it's at a the humbling. affiliate camp, you have hundreds of people there, so yeah. I just... Um, who was your first black belt that you promoted? I had four on the same day. In the order was, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Travis Luter, Tim Burrow, uh, Clay Pittman and William Vandry. Okay. And uh, what's next for CMJJ? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, <laughs> it's um, seeing ahead is one thing, catching up with the vision is something else. So what we're trying to do, it's funny because we had an affiliate weekend about to happen mm -hmm. in, in not, not long from now, maybe three weeks from now. And I was talking to Adam, uh, you see after the fact, you couldn't fix an issue then, so you have to wait until the next one. And then it became, okay, we saw something, and then it gets corrected at the end of the day or on the following day. Mm -hmm. And now we see something, and we can fix it as it happens. So hopefully, we're going to be in a situation that we anticipate. And, you know, I wouldn't say the hiccups would not ever be present, but I'm saying our ability to deal with situations has become more effective. Absolutely. I think our uh, staff is growing larger and we are recruiting different people that have more skill set to be more effective. That way the overall product and service becomes to a higher level. And uh, if you, s my vision is this, one or 10, 10 or 100, 100 or 1,000, 1,000 or 10,000, 10,000 or a million, is not how many people we reach, but the degree of impact on each of those individuals. Okay. So if I only have one person, but I know that the impact was so uh, everlasting, so impactful to a high degree, the, you know, in all senses, what we believe should be, you know, good health, good business, good, good life, you know, with the, through the martial arts. I mean, I, I feel like I'm a happy man, you know? Cool. And uh, if I can make you happy, I'm a happier person. Yes, sir. Awesome, that's it. Thank you, sir. Thank you.